but next up we've got Tom Pollard. Um, he says himself that he was reared, reared in Kilkenny and Connemara. Uh, no, reared by Kilkenny and Connemara parents uh, who holidayed in Ireland and brought him to every county and site of interest there um, and showed him both built and natural things, uh, which must have shaped his love for natural and heritage buildings. Um, he said he was lucky to learn dry stone walling uh, with someone called Pat McAfee in Drimnara Castle. That do apologise for my uh, pronunciation. Um, and he's continuously learning. He's a seasoned salvager and he believes in replacing like for like. And, um, um, to do that, he's practised in a many a skip and a market and a builder's yard to get the to get the salvage he needs. Um, he sees passing on the skills and ethos of conservation and restoration of huge importance. And um, his attitude to work personship is um, that finished and attitude uh, should be the best that you can manage. So without further ado, I'll uh, pass over to Tom. Are you happy with your screen sharing, Tom? Yeah, all good, thank you. Hello and good afternoon and thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the introduction. Um, so my slideshow, I'm just waiting for it to come up. I hope everyone can see it. There we go, it's my first slide. Um, <clears throat> so just a short talk on a repair we did um, September last year. Um, so we were looking enough to still have a little bit of daylight and okay, you know, the weather wasn't so bad. So <clears throat> the job we had at hand was a little bit of a mess. I'll show you now. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, I offered to do a talk because I really enjoyed the uh, the theme of, of Clayfest this year, building skills and building skills. So, you know, we're always building on our skills and it's our skills that, you know, we, we rely on to, to, you know, repair these buildings. And it's other people's skills as well that we rely on for information and for help and support sometimes when you're scratching your head. So I'll just show you a picture of um, these two cottages. This is a village called Clock. Clock is the Irish for the word stone. Um, I don't know. Uh, why clock is, is called that because it's um, an old village where there used to be 151 thatched buildings and only three remain and they're nearly all earth built um, with some aggregate in them but um, it's not exactly like a village of, of stone houses but a beautiful little village it was in its day I can imagine and uh, so the cottage on the left is the cottage that we were to repair and um, this was photographed around the 1980s and um, the village itself uh, used to host this house it was it was actually it was a police barracks and that's the earliest reference i can find to the cottage from 1839 and um, it was also a public house uh, lady there on the left annie shortall and her main clientele would have been coal miners the whole area um uh, was a coal mining area uh, up until the mid 1990s and also um in tandem with being a pub it was a chemist as well so there was a cure for every ailment i presume and in its last incarnation, it was a post office. Um, so the day we arrived, the carpenters had been and they had taken the roof down, um, which was a bit of a mistake because they'd taken it down a fortnight in advance. So it had a lot of rain in between. So you know, our, our, our earth wall, which is to the rear, our main repair, uh, was in pretty poor condition anyway. So it was quite um, badly washed out. So the gable, which is on the west side, um, that had collapsed and uh, in on, onto the neighbouring house and crushing the beautiful sycamore tree, which had grown out of the patch. Um, so that was constructed in stone, random rubble with uh, an earth mortar, like a grey marl type uh, mortar. Uh, this is the wall plate now, speaking of wobbly buildings, uh, to the north side, and that's the street side. So you've got uh, quite a differentiation bit there between the wobble here and here, but what we have found was that this was the original structure and following up from that was an addition to the structure and this is the wall plate and profile that we were tasked with basically consolidating I suppose and that's what we do we're, we're um, a small team of con uh, conservation masons and we spend a lot of time working with walls rebuilding repairing consolidating etc so day one uh, it looked a lot worse than when I had surveyed the building to quote and even see if I could you know take it on so we were left with this quite dismal site on day one. All the thatch that had been thrown off, as poor as it was, was just left in the heap. Um, as you stand back, you'll see the house itself. Uh, this was an old kind of milking shed, uh, which wasn't really part of what we had to do. We stitched into it with some fresh mortar. And you can see the stone and base there and all the, the, the cob here. And it was nicely washed out. 
and towards the end of the house uh, where the gable is. The next day we had taken the gable down very easily in one day and stored the stone away. Uh, this was the uh, adjoining wall of the, of the cottage beside the smaller cottage. They had a 300 millimeter um, gap between both uh, houses. So um, I don't know how that, but they sort of literally just let water run out of it into the main street. Also, the gable was not stitched into the south wall here. And this um, here was, it was separating away. And we found that had been actually a doorway. So it was a doorway and uh, no stitching into the gable itself. Um, and that's a really nice shot. I like this one. It's, it's like the anatomy of the building itself at this end of the elevation. Further up, it's, it's you know, there's a mass of earth. But down here where they had actually, you know, dug out the building to create a doorway, you can see, you know, the core. Uh, they've taken it back a bit, you know, added some stonework. The interior um, masonry again added on. And then, of course, that lovely cement render that you have in an awful lot of Irish cottages. Um, wall plate was completely perished. Um, we had two windows that we had to keep. This building was funded under the um, what was, used to be called Structures at Risk. It's the Historic Structures Fund today. And it's a wonderful fund and it looks after buildings as precarious as this. Of course, Ireland is littered with these. And, you know, again, it's something that's really close to my heart is our disappearing vernacular uh, architecture and disappearing with that are, are the skills, uh, are the materials, are the, the, the lifestyle, so many different things about it. Uh, a very, you know, poor building, unfortunately. And our um, task was just to stabilize it. We weren't asked to fully restore it. It was just to stop the deterioration and possibly uh, fix up uh, what was there and try and, you know, make it good again. Um, so here's one of the windows at the back. I'd say it was quite a late addition. It's not exactly, um, you know, like a Georgian shutter window. It's just a 1970s hardwood window propped up with some brick and a very poor timber lintel. Um, so luckily we found a local who could scrape back very gently uh, all the debris that had come from the roof. He was very good. He kept his cab and engine as far back as he could and relied on the jib and the bucket um, to take back away the waste. And he also kindly dug us two test holes so we could find suitable earth to um, carry out repairs. Um, so this was it. We were looking at wild masonry. We had this, you know, this base foundation of stone bedded in a, in a, in a washed out more or less earth mortar. And then every now and then you had these projections of stone as well, probably to do with, you know, additions to the house, etc. Because I probably started off as a very small cottage. Um, so we had huge amounts of decay um, from where the earth and, and, and masonry met. As you can see, you know, water was running down and washing back in. So our initial job was to just consolidate uh, the stonework that was there. We thoroughly cleaned it out of vegetation, washed it out, blew it out with compressor air and uh, dampened down and applied a hot mix lime mortar, uh, just a pure CL90, uh, which is, you know, just the pure lime itself. Uh, it's the line we normally like to use as well. It's like for like, but it's, it's lovely to, to work with and with a good aggregate. It's a very sturdy mix and I prefer it over an NHL any day. Um, and this is the marl, the, the earth that was used in the construction of the gable that we had to um, take down. It was fully perished. It had no binding qualities anymore, very easily crushed and powdered up again. Um, so here we are looking from the cottage out towards its neighboring wall. This is the, the West End. So you can kind of see the remains of a foundation and here's the neighboring wall, which we were also tasked with consolidating. So we repointed that in a hot mix mortar um, and we hired it as well. And we got straight into just building that back up again. You can see where it we stitched into the, the front facade. Here is just some random rubble, which kind of, I don't know why, but it was in between both houses and below it, <clears throat> there was an opening, a little culvert where debris could be washed out. And I met a, a lady who used to live in the house next door and she um, amended an old sweeping brush and put, I think, a 15 foot pole of hazel onto the head of the brush so she could wash out the culvert, uh, necessity being the mother of invention. And here you can see the foundation <clears throat> of where that doorway was. Um, so at least we had this to build up on. What we wanted to do was, uh, of course, reinstate this gable and uh, a new leaf wall here. And we, as we came up, we stitched in here. We might have removed a stone or two and stitched in. So we were part of the south facade as well. So our job was to try and literally reinstate this wall, get it back to good. And um, so what we had is our, our masonry footings, 
Uh, we had the stone flag wall plate and we had some fantastic stone to um, rebuild with. So there was a good resource of stone on site. And we had, of course, the, the wall, the, the cob wall. And um, there was some very large aggregate in it. Um, I'd never seen aggregate as big. Um, so our job was to make up for this missing mortar here. Um, and this was where the questions were asked, you know, what we do, how we do it. We're a small team, as I said, but we, you know, we love a challenge and we work well together. And, you know, we all have different kinds of leanings and experiences. So we knew we could do this job. We weren't afraid at all. But the problem was we couldn't just shutter and ram in. So we thought, so we had to find a way to attach our repair mortar to the existing mortar. Um, so, like I said, the JCB driver was good enough to dig us a few test holes. Uh, we found a very nice workable yellow clay under the subsoil, uh, low on, on, on um, sand, uh, but it's at the same time <clears throat> just a lovely yellow clay. We, we were very lucky. Um, we also salvaged a lot of what we took out of the damaged uh, wall itself. It was very, very poor. So we just kept very gently scraping away at the surface until we met, you know, good core of the wall. And we manufactured this large sieve using kind of rib lats, four by one. And we borrowed the old water tank that came out of the same cottage. And into that fell our earth. And we discarded all the aggregate uh, here. Uh, because our other fear was putting in too heavy an aggregate might just make this repair, you know, prone to falling outwards as well. Um, <clears throat> so here's an example of where one part of the old building met another part of the building and it's interesting to see that they they more or less match the materials like for like it was like a, a very similar build when they came to extending the um, the structure and above is our reinstated wall plate so we were using these flags and our worry was that rafters coming down to meet this their weight might topple over our freshly mortared wall plate so we were looking for ways as well to um sturdy up this core wall before we added any repair mortars so Alex, who works with us, he had this wonderful idea of in introducing a relieving arch into this large bulk of wall here with a long stretch uh, that was very much undermined from, from runoff from the roof. We also suspect that cattle might have been rubbing up against the building and wearing down the fabric. Um, so after a lot of discussion, we thought, yeah, this has to be done. We really should try and reinforce the wall internally as well as, you know, reinforce it by repair. So Alex got busy with his shovel, all this beautiful yellow clay and agar came out, which of course we salvaged. We weren't going to leave that be. Um, very much in the belief that, you know, we can put this building back together the way it was. We weren't looking to, you know, introduce any modern interventions like mesh uh, or anything like that. We wanted to just make sure that this wall, again, was 100% a cob build with an aggregate in it. So. There we are, we built a little profile and there was bricks on site and we added this elliptical arch into it. And something actually that was said to me afterwards, which is true, it's a pity we hadn't the time to do it. And it was Fela Butler who said it is, it was a shame you couldn't make cob blocks and actually create your arch and keep that the integrity of the materials in the wall. Um, but of course, you know, time had its constraints and we had to push on. Um, we were very conscious once we got the wall back to good again in, in, in terms of it, you know, the core was, was sturdy, this is what we want to work back off. So we employed the use of our on-site robot and this is our hydration system, H2O D2 as we nicknamed it. And we just kept damping down the wall and making sure that the core had moisture in it before we applied mortar and the core of course you know, would have you know, through capillary action just sucked out the mortar and we'd have had cracking and we'd have had failure. Um, so we had our elliptical arch in, we'd consolidated all our stonework and reinstated the wall plate. And we were thinking of how, how do we make sure <clears throat> that the core is in, you know, in good condition to accept this heavy repair we might have to put on. So we experimented with um, applying our own scud more or less, uh, a wash uh, of a kind of, um, it's, it's a hot mix basically. Um, and the thing about this build is we really, you know, we took it carefully and we took it only on our own kind of gut feelings. There was no way any off the shelf method statement could suit this particular problem. So, you know, people might be throwing their eyes to heaven that we added a very, you know, very kind of light coating of a hot mix mortar. Uh, the weather was good. We knew we could rely on the carbonation, but we wanted to consolidate and just create, um, I suppose, a homogenous base that we could attach to. Um, one of the things that kind of helped make a decision on how to repair was this little peg of wood. So when we were taking out uh, deteriorated work, 
and you can see some whitewash there from years ago and this little peg kind of stuck in my mind what's it doing in the wall you know there's only one i could find but it kind of occurred to me we could attach natural pegs to this wall uh, at an angle so hopefully they will be able to um like a coat hanger nearly hold on to our cob mix that we were going to use uh, to build back out this wall so um I have a coppice at home i'm always cutting hazel and i've always got seasoned hazel so you know being seasoned i knew it wasn't going to be prone to rot uh, with the dampening down it might open some fibers as well it would help uh, you know to a attach our, our mix to it so we attached uh, i don't know how many hundreds perhaps of these sharpened hazel pegs um all along the cleaned out and near prepped um, wall that we had to go to so what we were to do was we were going to put all these spikes in and uh, add our kind of base, our scud mix, as we'll call it, um, this kind of slip uh, onto it all. So we did that uh, up and down. You can see all the different layers there. I hope the picture is clear enough now. You can see we've left a lot of aggregate in. Um, and we're down to sound uh, clay cob mortar there, or mass. And we gave it a, a coating. And you can see the angle that we had the mats. We were hoping that when we did attach our materials, they would hang in there and, and stay attached. And this is Barry. Barry Noyce works with us as well, and um, a, a basket weaver by trade, actually, and uh, amongst other things. But um, a great man on a building again, a great knowledge of mortars. Um, so Barry came up with the wonderful idea of maybe a matrix to connect an awful lot of these spikes. And they look very long there. We did trim them all back to just, you know, within, you know, behind where the finished uh, would be, the finished surface would be. Uh, Brian Tobin, you might know him. He's uh, another practitioner in Ireland. He would have given a course in um, Wexford, actually, at Clayfest 2018. And uh, another man uh, who wasn't on site and was just at the end of a phone, but he was very, very helpful in helping us design and decide upon using what kind of our, our cob mix. And his advice was to use as much straw as you think you'll get away with to lighten the load. So I have to just mention Brian and thank him for that, um, for his, his sound advice. So there's the matrix of, of, of Barry's hazel going through all our pegs. And uh, our scud went on and you can see, you know, there seems to be something for our cob to hold on to now. Um, all this uh, willow as well is well seasoned. And of course, uh, like our hazel as well. Everything else is consolidated now. We've mortared up all our brickwork, straightened it up, made it all good. Uh, and look quite nice. We used to sit back having cups of tea waiting for it to carbonate. And, we used to quite enjoy the look of it. There was something kind of sculptural about it. And the carpenters luckily had got ahead of us now when they had a wall plate to work off. And we managed to make the wall plate wide enough uh, to accommodate a straight run of wall plate with the wobbly nature of this building. So our cob, um, what I was doing was I was mixing my clay in this kind of a Soroto, a forced paddle mixer uh, in an evening and we'd make a, a fine pile of it. And the next morning, we'd add a small bit of, of uh, kibble, so 5% uh, and no more. I've used it before in, in bedding mortars and, and pointing mortars. And I just love the reaction, the relationship of the, the hot line, the, the kibble, the, the CL90, just that pure line with the earth. And having been to previous clay fests, I learned about you know, how they work together, the nature of earth and the nature of, of, of how it works with aggregates, how it works on itself. So we were, you know, very confident knowing that we're making a mix that is not in any way outlandish. We thought we had, you know, a good mix. And again, with the advice we got was, you know, take the, take that weight out, add as much straw as you can. We managed to get some barley straw, which we chopped up and added to the mix. And little speck there of unslaked lime. And we daubed it on and we attached it to the pegs and daubed in between and just constantly, you know, by hand forced this on this, this lovely mix. And we were very lucky with the weather. You know, we got that you know, tail end of an Indian summer. So we were very happy. Uh, you know, dehydration wasn't a problem. We had our misting going on anyhow. We were very careful um, and trying to be as true as possible to the structure because as much of a mess as it was, it, this, this building, it might look like it was a headache. This building actually really worked with us. I don't know if people kind of understand that sort of way of thinking, but I believe if you know if, if you really try and do right by the building, things will go easier for you. So there it is, kind of compressed now, and we've kind of scra scraped into it. We've created that rough coat now as well for our finished coat. 
Um, so it's looking quite nice and it's looking very sturdy. We were no way vertical. We had lots of weighing and texture and form going on, but uh, so much more, um, you know, sturdy than it would have been when we arrived on site. And uh, there we are now literally just adding on more or less what you could call our float coat. Um, White washing had begun uh, just before we left. It was a job that our client was very interested in taking on themselves. So we were happy just to um, give them a, you know, a, a quick insight into how to apply the whitewash and you know, what way to make it, what consistency might work for the time of year, etc. And um, that's the rear, uh, basically, we get to keep this 300 mil culvert going. The thatch did a fantastic job. <clears throat> and um, we had built up uh, you know, a new gable that did stitch into the wall now. So we know now that the house is four adjoining walls as it should be. Um, so a nice picture of the the, that what was a wreck of a window with a stone lintel now put in and all the brickwork had been taken down and we replaced what were perished and you know kept the what was true there as well um so there's a shot from the back probably grim looking i suppose but you know end of the day the sun wasn't on it uh, i've been back to visit and on, on south facing when the sun is hitting it, it it's a very fine looking facade now and from the front from the street side now the new thatch she's looking good and um, that was it. That was our repair. And thank you very much for having me. Hello, Glenn. Thank you, Tom. That was fascinating. I absolutely, um, I can see in the comments, people were very much with you there. Uh, in terms of, fear. You, you just had such an intuitive, the way you were even describing it was so intuitive like you were asking the building what it needed and you were just going with it in a really um uh, kind of sensitive and um what have i written down yeah sensitive and intuitive and amazing is what i've written down <laughs> um so thank you very much we're going to have questions after the next speaker so i'd like to invite you back then but you're getting loads of lovely comments uh so do have a read of those while you're on backstage waiting for the next bit um 